The 1984 Aeroflot Flight 3352 disaster happened when an ATC fell asleep. The Linate Airport tragedy of 2001 was marked by a controller's complete unawareness of aircraft positions. The 2002 Uberlingen mid-air collision was caused by an overworked controller with faulty equipment. Why do air traffic controllers sometimes make fatal mistakes? They're humans too, but we all hope those somewhat related to huge birds weighing tons miraculously flying in the skies are more human and skilled enough not to cause a catastrophe. Rest assured, ATC is a constantly evolving service, sponsored by millions of dollars and regulated by numerous standards. In this video, I will discuss human factors classifications and how we ensure you can enjoy your on-flight meat or tuna sandwich in peace. What are the human factors? Human factors is basically the science of understanding how humans interact with all the cool tech and procedures in aviation. There are countless studies and theories about human factors and most of them have really good points to understand both our human capabilities and limitations as well. Today we're going to take a look at the most accurate theories in aviation to study why exactly a person F it up. Let's begin with the shell system. The shell model is a tool that defines the whole scope of an aviation system in four separate elements which all interact with each other. The acronym SHELL stands for Software, Hardware, Environment, Liveware and Liveware again. Yes, it's that important that we mention it twice. First up, software. In aviation, this includes things like manuals, operating procedures, letters of agreements, checklists and regulations. Imagine trying to assemble IKEA furniture without the instructions. You'd end up hugging that shark toy after mounting the chair and finding a few extra screws. Right? Same deal here. When the software is clear and user-friendly, it helps our aviation heroes make fewer mistakes. Next, hardware. This is the physical stuff. The radios, radar screens, light control panels, navigation equipment, monitoring screens, control towers, and those fancy headsets. If the hardware is dodgy, even the best specialists can't provide good service. And when the hardware is reliable and well-maintained, everyone has the tools to work safely, accurately, and efficiently. Then we have the environment. This isn't just about the weather, storm clouds, and turbulence adding unwanted drama. It also covers the physical working environment. The lighting, noise levels, room temperature, and workspace layout. Even the chair you're sitting on while you're working. Imagine trying to juggle in a dark, noisy room like your office, but with thousands of lives at stake. It's not fun and definitely not safe. A well-designed environment helps our aviation folks stay focused and efficient. Now let's talk about liveware. This is where it gets personal. It's the human element. The people in the control facilities, control tower, and maintenance hangar. Humans are wonderfully complex, but also prone to errors. The first liveware in the shell model looks at how these humans interact with all the other elements. Software, hardware, and environment. Are the rules, regulations, and checklists easy to understand? Is the equipment user-friendly? Can they work without distractions? And then there's liveware again because humans also interact with other humans. Communication, teamwork, and leadership are the social networks of aviation. Things run smoothly if the communication lines are clear and the teamwork is solid. But if there's miscommunication or poor teamwork, it's pure chaos and confusion. It is a disaster just waiting to happen sooner or later. Any change within the aviation shell system can have serious consequences. For example, a minor equipment change in the hardware element requires an evaluation of its impact on the controllers in the liveware box. We can use the shell model to understand the relationships between systemic human factors during operational audits, which can help reduce errors, enhance safety, and improve processes. Error categories. Humans are amazing, but we're not perfect. We all have our my bad moments. Understanding these errors can help us make flying even safer. So let's break it down in a way that's as smooth as a well-piloted flight. Slips and lapses. Slips and lapses are like oops in the aviation world. A slip is when you intend to do one thing but do something else, like when you meant to say heading 120 but end up with heading 210. A lapse, on the other hand, is when you forget to do something altogether. Picture yourself making a cup of coffee but forgetting to add water. In aviation, slips and lapses can lead to missteps in procedures or incorrect entries, which are usually caught and corrected quickly. Rule-based blunders. Mistakes aren't your typical oops moments, they're more like, huh, that seemed like a good idea at the time moments. 
Mistakes happen when you've got the wrong plan from the start. Think of them as the result of faulty thinking. There are two types here, rule-based and knowledge-based. Rule-based mistakes happen when you apply a rule or procedure inappropriately. Imagine using a cake recipe to make a pie. You're following the steps but end up with a tuna sandwich. This could be using the wrong checklist for a specific situation in aviation. An aircraft reports that they have a medical emergency because of a sick passenger on board, and you start following the checklist for an incapacitated pilot thinking that the aircraft cannot fly normally. Knowledge-based mistakes are even trickier. These occur when you don't have enough knowledge to make the right decision. It's like conquering Star Wars Lego without the instructions. You're bound to make a mistake because you're missing crucial information. Pilots and controllers can make knowledge-based mistakes if they encounter a situation they haven't been trained for or fully understand. For example, a controller gives an aircraft with wide wingspan taxi instructions to enter the runway from a point that is not suitable for wide aircraft because of an ongoing construction site next to the taxiway. Lastly, we have violations. These are the deliberate deviations from rules or procedures. Before you imagine controllers going rogue, remember that not all violations are created equal. Some are routine violations, minor shortcuts taken to save time, like driving five miles per hour over the speed limit because you're running late. Then there are exceptional violations where someone bends the rules in a tough situation, like speeding up to get a passenger to the hospital. Finally, there are the downright unacceptable violations where someone blatantly ignores safety procedures, driving through a red light just because you didn't feel like stopping. In aviation, routine violations might happen when controllers skip a checklist step they think is unnecessary or omit a part of phraseology to save time, while exceptional violations might occur during an emergency. The key is to minimize these violations through training, oversight, and a strong safety culture. D12. Then, there's the dirty dozen of human factors. Do any Eminem fans appreciate the name of this one? No, it's not a squad of misfit soldiers either, but rather a list of 12 human factors that can lead to errors in aviation. First, we've got a lack of communication. This is the classic telephone game problem. When information isn't passed along correctly, mistakes happen. Your colleague mumbles an aircraft call sign and you hear the numbers 343 instead of 434. Clear, concise communication is key to keeping everyone on the same page and out of trouble. Next is complacency. This sneaky gremlin shows up when you've done something a thousand times and think you can do it in your sleep. It's like making the same tuna sandwich every day and suddenly forgetting the tuna because you're on autopilot. Same can happen easily when you gain some experience in your working position if you don't pay attention to it. Lack of knowledge is when you don't know what you don't know. This can mean not fully understanding systems or procedures in the working position leading to errors. There can be two levels of this. The better option is that you know that you don't know. Then you'll search for the required information. The worst case scenario is that you don't know something and you also don't know that you don't know. This is the critical gray area where bad things start to happen. Distraction is that moment when you're focused on something important and then suddenly something draws your attention away and you lose track. In aviation, distractions can come from inside or outside the work environment, leading to serious mistakes. It can be an airplane doing something unusual, or an unexpected visitor showing up at the workplace. Lack of teamwork is like a band with everyone playing their own tune. It's a mess. In aviation, effective teamwork means everyone works together harmoniously, sharing information and supporting each other. Fatigue sneaks in when you're running on empty. Fatigue impairs judgment, slows reaction times, and can lead to severe errors. Fatigue can build up gradually, for example, after many consecutive night shifts. It can also happen during one single day when you work two long periods on duty without a break. It's imperative to have mitigations in place in order to manage risks and errors caused by fatigue. These can be, for example, a maximum number of night shifts you can work in a row. Lack of resources occurs when you're trying to cook a gourmet meal with a can opener and a spoon. This can mean not having the right tools, parts, or personnel to do the job safely in aviation. Usually this is related to personnel not having enough resources to have the appropriate amount of working positions open, or to having people work too long in position, resulting in fatigue. Pressure pushes you to go faster, work harder, and sometimes cut corners. It's like having a boss breathing down your neck while trying to finish a report, 
In air traffic control, pressure can come from tight schedules, high workloads, shareholder expectations, or demanding environments. Lack of assertiveness is when you know something's wrong, but don't speak up. It's like watching someone about to step into a puddle and staying silent. In aviation, assertiveness means voicing concerns and taking action when safety is at risk. If you notice something out of the ordinary, make sure to mention it. Stress can come from tight deadlines, challenging conditions, or purely from personal issues. Stress in aviation and air traffic control is a huge topic on its own, and we're going to dig deeper into it later. To be the first to witness it, subscribe to the channel now. Lack of awareness is being oblivious to what's happening around you. It's like walking through a park of nails with your eyes closed. Not a great idea. What are you doing in that park with nails anyway? In aviation, situational awareness means being aware of the environment, weather, traffic situation, your equipment status, and others' actions. Finally, we have norms. These are the unwritten rules and practices that develop over time. Everyone in the office knows that the best coffee is made in the second floor kitchen, even though it's not official. In aviation, norms can lead to complacency and unsafe practices if not aligned with safety standards. Sometimes the workplace norms can be those little violations of cutting corners here and there. Everybody thinks that they are okay until something really bad happens. Swiss cheese model by James Reason. Picture a stack of Swiss cheese slices. Each slice represents a layer of defense against failure, but like all good Swiss cheese, they have holes. When the holes line up just right, trouble can slip through. If you start researching pretty much any aviation accident or incident, you'll notice that this cheese model is extremely accurate. Usually none of the accidents happen because of only a single reason. There are many contributing factors and preconditions that start unfolding one by one. When this chain of unwanted events starts lining up perfectly, without any preventative measures blocking the scenario, we end up with an incident or even a serious accident. Let's break the Swiss cheese layers a bit further. Layer 1, Organizational Influences. This is the big cheese of the safety stack, the top layer. The company's culture, policies, and management decisions. If the bosses are cutting corners to save a buck, it's like adding extra holes to this slice. A dodgy foundation that makes everything else wobbly. On the other hand, a solid foundation within the company makes the cheese more like delicious Gouda with no holes in it. Layer 2. Unsafe supervision. Next, we've got the supervisors, the middle management. They're supposed to keep things running smoothly, but if they're not paying attention or providing proper oversight, you get more holes. Layer 3. Preconditions for unsafe acts. The everyday working conditions. Are the staff well rested and well trained? Is the equipment up to snuff? Are all the procedures tested and found to be solid and reliable in all conditions? Are there backup systems in place if something goes wrong concerning equally the technology and personnel? The more you answer no, the more holes you have in the cheese. Layer 4. Unsafe acts. Finally, we have the frontline operators, the controllers, pilots, technicians, and all the people involved. These are the folks who directly interact with the system. Mistakes happen because, you know, humans. Claiming that you will never have a little slip or a lapse here and there is just deceiving yourself. Sometimes you just realize being in a situation where you had poor judgment and thinking to yourself, damn, I should have known better. What do we do with human factors today? First, we acknowledge that accidents do happen. It's usually more complex than someone goofed up. Instead of playing the blame game, we dig deep to understand the why behind errors, helping to prevent future flubs. And one key aspect is not to always focus on the negatives. We tend to think, why did things go wrong when they do? But we usually don't pay attention to why things went well as they do 99% of the time. We should be aware of all the systems in place that make us perform perfectly and apply those same principles as much as we can to improve our work. Knowledge is power and training helps operators understand how and why their actions are performed, leading to better decision making. Interfaces and automation must be designed with humans in mind, ensuring they're intuitive and supportive. We learn from everyday situations to identify potential threats before they escalate into serious incidents. Ready for some more? Check out this video to know more what air traffic controllers do every day. We bust some of the most common ATC myths while we're at it. See you there.